webinar with an acknowledgement, acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are located today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. So again, welcome on behalf of the Animal Research Review Panel. We're delighted to welcome you to the first of our webinar series for 2022 with today's webinar focusing on rehoming. For those of you that are not aware, the Animal Research Panel is defined under the New South Wales Animal Research Act 1985 and amongst our functions is evaluation of the code of practice in the regulating the conduct of animal research and supply of animals for use in connection with animal research. As part of this function, we consider engagement, communication and support of the research community to comply with the code a key priority. And through this and our upcoming webinars, we hope to achieve this goal. Before I begin, I'd like to um, run through some housekeepings as to how the webinars will proceed today. We have three presentations and we will run through all the presentations before we have an opportunity for the presenters to answer questions at the end. However, please, during the sessions, please submit your questions as we go through the Q&A tab. I will then pose your questions to each speaker at the end of the session overall, either individually, if you would like a specific person to answer your question, or if appropriate, to all speakers to enable them to respond. We will answer as many questions as time allows today. However, for those questions that we don't answer or perhaps um, can't answer at the time, we will certainly circulate a Q&A document following the webinar. And I'd like to just remind you all that the webinar is being recorded. So without ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker today. Our first speaker is Paula Wallace from the Liberty Foundation. Paula is founder and director of Liberty Foundation Australia, a not-for-profit dedicated to rehoming the full range of domestic animals from research. Since 2017, the organisation has rehomed more than 450 animals from research into forever homes in the community. Paula is a member of the Animal Research Review Panel and was a co-author of the New South Wales Government's Research Animal Rehoming Guidelines. So Paula, I hand over to you. Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Jackie. I'm just going to put my presentation up. Okay, so thanks everyone for being here today for this really important presentation. We have something a little bit different for you today, something I hope you find interesting. Uh, and I should add that the Animal Research Review Panel, of which I am a member, has been very supportive of rehoming animals from research in New South Wales. And today um, we're going to be sharing with you about the rehoming of domestic animals from research. And to start with, I'm just going to share a one minute excerpt from one of our videos. So I'll play that for you now. See the light of a new day dawning. Feel the love from a beating heart. You catch a ride to the top of the world. This is where we start. No, we can't make it last forever. We gotta use all the time we have. And you know that we'll never say never if we ever get the chance. And it's good to be alive. So I think that the video really speaks for itself. I mean, this is what we do. We rehome the full range of domestic animals from research to private owners. Liberty Foundation is the name of the charity. We're actually a company limited by guarantee that operates as a not-for-profit in Australia. We have a volunteer board and a volunteer workforce. And all that means is that we can scale to work in any state or territory in Australia. To date, our activities have been focused in New South Wales and the ACT and to a lesser extent in Victoria. We have been actively rehoming since late 2017, 
And since that time, we have successfully rehomed more than 450 animals from research. They include dogs, cats, rabbits, guinea pigs, rats, mice, and fish. Why do we do this? We do this because we see that the research community needs a service to assist in providing the right kind of care and rehoming options for these animals. And we believe that animals who are healthy enough to relocate from a research facility should be given the opportunity to do so in a safe and ethical way. It may seem obvious, but it's worth defining what we mean by rehoming. We mean that the ownership of the animal is transferred to another party other than the research establishment. This might be a member of the public adopting the animal directly from the research establishment. Well, this may be a charity like ours taking ownership of the animal for the purposes of rehoming. Both of these scenarios should involve the exchange of a contract, transferring ownership. Today, we're going to be focusing on domestic animals that are rehomed into private homes. You can, however, rehome non-domestic or exotic or native animals into private homes or for exhibition purposes, but this requires specific licenses to be obtained. The research animal rehoming guidelines issued by the Animal Research Review Panel in late 2020 provide advice on this, and it's freely available to download at the Animal Ethics InfoLink website. The guidelines also provide advice on rehoming of livestock and releasing native animals into the wild. In all cases, the National Code states clearly that rehoming must be approved by the relevant Animal Ethics Committee, and the options chosen for rehoming should have a minimal or transient impact on the well-being of the animal. In our case, we also obtain approval from the management of the research establishment. The opportunity for rehoming is largely untapped in Australia. We have just scratched the surface and the current capacity of charities offering these services is quite small. But we have done critical work in demonstrating how it can be done and how we can work together to provide more humane outcomes for these animals. Liberty Foundation has been able to sign rehoming agreements with numerous research establishments, large and small, our experience to date has also proven that there is a demand from the general public for domestic animals coming out of research. With the statistics publicly available, it's not possible to determine exactly the number of animals that might be suitable and available for rehoming each year. But in the case of dogs and cats in New South Wales, for instance, we can make an educated guess that it's somewhere between maybe 100 to 200 dogs and 100 cats. If a mandatory retirement age was introduced at some point in the future, these numbers would increase. We've only recently started collecting statistics on the fate of animals in New South Wales, and we should start to see an upward trend in these numbers from 2020 onwards. There are some stories on our website which delve further into the statistics for anyone who's into that, and you can find them at libertyfoundation.org.au. Just look on our blog categories on the homepage and go to statistics. As mentioned earlier, the research animal rehoming guidelines are a valuable resource for anyone interested in this area. The section for research establishments talks about managing and preparing animals for rehoming. There are some simple but effective measures that research establishments can put in place to really support animals in the rehoming process. And I know that Carly will be talking more about this today. I think it's important to point out that rehoming really is a win-win for everyone involved. There are significant benefits for staff morale, especially for those working with animals every day, to see them go on to lead fulfilling lives in their retirement or second life. The rehoming process is outlined in the guidelines. It is in essence, a simple process. In our case, we sign a rehoming agreement with the research establishment before any rehoming takes place. This document is also approved by the Animal Ethics Committee the document outlines the rights, responsibilities and guarantees of both parties. At the end of the document, there is a section which needs to be completed each time an animal leaves the research facility with details of the individual animal. This enables us to receive vital information about the animal, such as date of birth, results of veterinary checks, their microchip number, and any information that we need that is critical to their ongoing care. It also enables the research establishment to keep a record of all animals that are leaving their facilities and where they went. 
The reality is that once ownership of the animal is transferred to us, the research establishment is no longer responsible for their care, but it doesn't mean that they're not interested. And this is where it's really important to establish and maintain good working relationships with your rehoming group. We provide timely updates on the animals after they've left the facilities um, that we may have rehomed or that are in foster care. This includes the provision of written updates, evidence on um, dissexing or vaccination, photographs and videos where requested. It's up to each research establishment and its animal ethics committee to decide the best pathway for rehoming for their animals. The most common way is to partner with an external rehoming organisation or to rehome directly to people, usually uh, through employees or family and friends. It is vital that you understand the needs of the animals you're rehoming and find an organisation that has the experience and or resources to care for them adequately. As an example, um, while some younger dogs may transition fairly well to a shelter environment like the RSPCA or the Animal Welfare League, some older dogs um, who've, who've been in research for a significant portion of their lives may struggle in that environment and they would benefit from the one-on-one -on -one time with a foster carer in the community. And also to be partnered with a charity that can provide them with more individualized support and find them a home that suits their needs. The benefits of using an external rehoming organization is that it can attract more adopters for the animals, as well as facilitating the whole adoption process, including follow-up post-adoption. It can also be helpful where a period of time in foster care is deemed beneficial for the animal. For instance, if we're trying to bond pairs or groups together before rehoming. At Liberty, we specialize in providing individualized care and support and have a strong track record of finding homes for animals with specific needs. Um, we do have experience in bonding and rehoming male guinea pigs, which some other charities may find difficult. We've found some novel solutions for rehoming large groups of male guinea pigs where they have plenty of space, such as rehoming in organic enclosed orchards or into large converted chook pens. We also work with other sanctuaries, such as rabbit sanctuaries, to find partners for our rabbits if they come out as singles. We get them neutered while they're in foster care with us and then we find them a compatible partner so that they can be rehomed with a friend, usually in male female pairs. Um, we've also developed an innovative way of rehoming groups of mice. We provide our adopters with a naturalistic enclosure, which we call a simulated woodland. And you can see a picture there of one of our, of our woodlands. These are units that are about uh, one and 1.5 meters long. They have glass sides and a wooden top. So normally this has a wooden top on it. Um, we fill them with a deep layer of hemp fiber bedding. And we also put in a, a digging box uh, with soil. We put in houses, tunnels, toys, hidey holes, et cetera, as well as aged logs and branches. This enables the mice to exhibit their natural behaviors of tunneling, digging, foraging, running, and climbing. We can house groups of eight mice happily in these enclosures. And with a good and varied diet and plenty of exercise, our little lab mice can live for up to two and a half years, which is actually quite old for a mouse. So I hope that gives you a good insight into the work that we're doing to assist research establishments to consider rehoming more often and for more animals. Given this is quite a new area, we spend a lot of time doing advocacy, education and making presentations about rehoming as well as producing videos to expand awareness of our work amongst the general public. Of course, this is an essential part of the work we do because it is one thing to secure the release of animals from research facilities, but we do need to provide them with, with loving forever homes. It's truly a collective effort and we are happy to play our part in making every rehoming a success. If you'd like to connect with us, we're on all social media platforms. We have our own YouTube channel. You can contact us anytime to talk about your situation and how we may be able to help you. But for today, I'm going to leave you with a short one minute video of some of our beautiful rehomed rabbits. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Paula. Um, as people will obviously appreciate, a lot of time and thought has been put into that presentation from Paula to capture the work that she's doing. Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to rem no worries. I'd like to remind people that um, if you do have questions for Paula, um, don't be afraid. Find detail, general. Please post them into the Q and A, um, and we'll be able to get back to those at the end of the the next group of speakers. So look, that gives me great pleasure now to introduce our next speakers, uh, Nikki Steedenham, who's the director founder and Tam Burke, who's the president founder of Beagle Freedom Australia. Tam and Nikki are co-founders of Beagle Freedom Australia. Tam has been rehoming beagles and hounds since 2005, joined by Nikki in 2008. Over the years, they have rehomed thousands of beagles from various backgrounds, hundreds of them being from research and teaching, many others from intensive breeding facilities, pounds, shelters, and private surrenders. Thank you so much for being part of this webinar series today, Tam and Nikki, and um, over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, the screen. Okay. Hi, my name's Tan, and I thought we'd start our presentation today giving you a bit of background on us. We officially launched Beagle Freedom Australia in 2013 after rehoming beagles for approximately 18 years. Being in rescue for so long, we started to notice that there were no rescue groups assisting with the rehoming of facility animals. We were closely working with the behaviourist on some special needs dogs that needed assistance. And she mentioned to us that she was on an AEC and so we suggested that we'd be more than happy to assist her with the rehoming of any facility animals that were up for retirement. So we started collaborating with her and the facilities that she worked with in her duties as an AEC member. That's how BFA was born. We're a registered charity and we have a core team of five committee members. We also have an extensive team of volunteers who are experts in their field, including vets, vet nurses, vet behaviourists, trainers, hydrotherapists and multiple trained foster carers. We are so lucky to have such an amazing team, many of whom have been with us since the beginning. We have a particular interest in behavioural cases and we've also worked with major pounds and shelters both in Victoria and interstate. We take on cases such as fearful and timid dogs, dogs presenting with behaviours such as picker, spinning, or any fear-based behaviours. Even though we're based in Victoria, we do work with facilities Australia-wide. We've set up a sanctuary on our 10-acre property in country Victoria, specifically for all ex-research animals. We're best set up to house dogs, cats, and farm animals. We do, and we have taken in a wide range of other species. Over the next slide, you'll see a few photos of the property, which is where the animals will start their journey with us. It gives us a chance to be able to observe the animals and to spend time with them, getting to know them and to start informal training with them. The property allows us to be able to safely take them on walking trails, introduce them to other species, and it allows us to be able to formulate an individual train, training programs catered to their needs. You can see that we've got walking trails, the dam, wildlife, six naughty goats, which are beagles with horns. The dogs absolutely love walking the property and it's a fantastic bonding experience for both them and us. The most important part of the rehoming and preparing process from facility to rescue is collaboration. By collaborating together, we're setting up the animals to succeed, enhancing staff morale on all sides and working together for the same end result. The relationship formed between handlers and animals is a powerful and an emotional one. And in order for us to do justice to the existing relationships, we like to find out as much as we can about the individual animal and their needs. The facilities that we work with provide us with detailed bios, including their general GP vet history, vaccination status. We provide our direct details to the staff and encourage them to contact us if they have any detail, any questions at all. We provide ongoing updates to the staff, set up private photo albums so everyone can see the animals in their foster homes and new homes. We love it when we receive updates from the families so we can only imagine how much the staff enjoy them as well. As far as age goes, there's no age that's too old to be rehomed. We've had dogs as old as 14.5 years of age and cats over 16. They've all adapted wonderfully and the bonds that they've formed with their new families are unlike any that we've ever seen. We've also taken in a lot of special needs animals over the years. And as far as our organisation is concerned, there's no limitation to what these animals can do. 
And having the framework that we have in place means that we can provide them with everything that they could possibly need. Here's a few short videos of three particular special needs dogs. This is Kiwi, he has cerebellar hyperplasia and is without a doubt the happiest dog I have ever met in my life. Nothing is a challenge for this beautiful boy and he's adored by everyone that meets him. The next dog is Harry. Harry's got age-related arthritis and, and his knees were causing him ongoing issues. Weekly hydrotherapy, vet visits and medication management have made an amazing difference to his mobility. The last one is Jess. She came into our care needing TPLO surgery and after discussing her case in conjunction with the facility vet, we all agreed that retirement would be her best option for surgery and medical rehabilitation. Jess was placed into foster care with a surgical vet nurse who couldn't part with her and eventually adopted her. Uh, next, we'll talk about transport. Um, at, at Beagle Freedom, uh, we make every effort to do all of our own transport. It can be a stressful time for the animals, whether it's just an hour trip or an overnight trip. So we want it to go smoothly every time. Um, we have used air transport before and we find it's definitely an option, especially for extremely long distance travel, but our preferred method is road. Pictured here is our main transport van on the left. It's a large six metre people mover and it's been specifically fitted out for the safe, secure transport of animals. In the centre is our brand new purpose-built dog trailer. Um, it has seven birth, sorry, six berths, all with double doors. Um, we had it fitted with a state-of-the-art electric air conditioning unit. Uh, this means that we can control the temperature inside the trailer from the cabin of the van. It's quiet and it's clean. It runs on an electric battery and is one of the first of its kind in Australia. Previously, the only air conditioning you could get on a dog trailer was petrol powered, which was loud and had a lot of fumes. Um, on the right, we've got um, a refurbished horse float. It belongs to one of our volunteers and we've used it for several transport runs. It's been sealed up and fitted out comfortably with two large dog crates. It's a great resource when transporting a small number of animals. We also have another two dog trailers and another van to accommodate transport of a large number of animals. Um, we've, we have several safety protocols in place for both cleaning and sanitizing, as well as safe, secure transfer of, of the animals. When we transport cats, they're always transferred from the carrier to a crate inside a closed van. They travel in a covered individual crate with access to litter and an igloo bed to snuggle in. Uh, all the animals have access to fresh food and water at all times. We ensure that we have fill away diffusers plugged in 24 hours in advance. Um, and each igloo is sprayed 15 minutes before loading. We have silken capsules to sprinkle into their food as well. Similarly, the dogs have adaptable diffusers and spray as well as silken in their food too. The van also has air conditioning and climate control throughout. So it's not just in the cabin, but all through the van. Um, and there is always at least two drivers. Um, and we do a deep clean after every trip with F10 and crates and beds and bedding is washed and scrubbed after every trip. Um, Beagle, at Beagle Freedom, we also cover all the costs surrounding transport of, of any animals that we take in. And the only people who do our transport are members of our committee. Um, this ensures safety, confidentiality and peace of mind. After transport comes the new beginning. Here's where all the fun stuff happens. As mentioned, the animals start their journey at the sanctuary. Here we get them used to the different sights and sounds that they may not have experienced before. TV, set of stairs, different floor services, cars, vacuums, etc. Our group is set up differently from many others. This allows us to facilitate any animal who may need a little longer in care than others 
or in some cases, they may even retire at HQ with us. We've been lucky enough to share our home and lives with a very special boy named Ginger. He's pictured up on the top left. Ginger was the most outgoing, funny, happy and confident beagle that came into our care with 15 of his friends. Ginger was the first one to come up and engage. He loved his walks, nothing bothered him at all. But little Ginger was hiding a secret from us. He loved chewing and he loved swallowing anything he could get his mouth around. Ginger was diagnosed with pica by our vet team and the decision was made in conjunction with our vets that Ginger would retire here with us. That way he could be closely monitored for the rest of his life. Ginger lived a full and happy life here with us and his behavioural and medical needs were managed daily. We sadly lost our beautiful boy late last year to uh, oral hemangiosarcoma. We miss him every day. Olive's story is a little different from Ginger's. That's Olive on the far right of the slides. Olive is a, be a beautiful big hound girl who required a little more time, patience and creative thinking during her time in care. We have a fantastic relationship with Olive's facility and due to the information they've given to us about Olive, we were able to formulate the right management plan for her. Olive would make sure she placed herself as far away from humans as she could, as you can see in the photo second from the right, but at the same time, she was overtly curious. She'd dance in excitement when she'd first see us and when it was dinner time, but she'd also always hold herself back, not quite wanting to engage like her friends. With all of this in mind, we decided that she would thrive in foster care with one of our experienced families. The transformation in Olive from day one until now has been outstanding. She no longer hides away or keeps herself at a distance. She's now waking her foster dad up at 5 a.m. every morning to go for a beach walk. She loves her six-year-old human brother and her three foster siblings. She demands pats, seeks out attention and lays her head con contently on her human's lap. The video to the right shows just how much she loved her beach walks. The time has now come for Olive to be placed up for adoption. And whilst we search for her ever home, she's happily walking on the beach at first night and struggling with her pack at night. In this next slide, we've got Ginger on the on the top. You can see him laying on his bed and see him with one of his siblings, little Noot Noot, and Ginger down at the beach. Down on the bottom are all of Olive. Olive at her happy place at the beach, Olive with her beautiful family and Olive cuddling with her humans. Um, okay, as part of our process, Every animal gets thoroughly checked by our vets. Any required vet work is completed before home, before rehoming. As a basis, we run a wellness blood panel on every animal. It gives the adoptive families a baseline to refer back to later in life if they ever need to. Um, if there's any specialty services that are needed, we'll make sure they're all completed as well. This includes any surgeries from desexing to other, as well as any dermatology, cardiology, orthopedic or ophthalmology or anything in between. Um, we offer a lifetime support for any of our animals that require any ongoing medications or have special needs. Um, we do this so that we can be assured that their adoption prospects are never hindered due to any ongoing costs. We find that most families will opt to take on the costs regardless, but we all, will always provide that safety net for all of our families for life. Our actual adoption process is considered quite strict. We have an online application form that must be filled in and it has around 37 questions to fill out. Uh, the submit, from the submitted forms, we shortlist families based on what best suits the animals in our care. We conduct phone interviews and reference checks and we set up a meet and greet. We travel to the potential home personally and we conduct yard and house checks. We get to know the family in person and introduce the dog or cat to them and any other family members, including pets. Depending on the individual animal, we might do several meet and greets over a period of time to slowly get them used to being in the home. Uh, once the animal gets 
Once the animal stays at the home overnight, we begin what's known as a trial period. We remain the legal guardian during this time. Um, the, the trial period can be anywhere from two weeks long to two months long and sometimes even longer. Whatever is in the best interests of the individual animals. Once a trial period is complete, we go ahead and finalise the adoption, change the microchip details and formalise all the paperwork. Um, here we've got some of the many faces we've rehomed recently. Um, in the top we've got Pip um, and then we've got uh, Tish, the cat, Jess and Obi snuggling together. Across the bottom we've got Poppy, Buttons and his new little mate, Merv, and Timmy and his sister having a, a bit of a snuggle. Our philosophy is that by working together, we can all achieve an amazing outcome for the animals and the humans that care for them. We're proud of the relationships that we've built up with facilities over the years. The staff engagement and passion, and more than anything, we want to let you know that these animals are nothing short of extraordinary. The joy and happiness that they bring their humans is beyond amazing. The bond that each animal has with their forever family is like nothing we have ever seen. For us as an organisation, it's an honour to be able to assist in this journey. And we're grateful every day to have the opportunity to do the work that we do. And lastly, we'd like to thank the members of our DPI and the New South Wales Government for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you to each and every person who's attended today. And thank you to those who continually promote working relationships and the rehoming of research animals. Um, here we've got a little video just showing some of the happy faces having a good time in their new homes. Uh, so that's it for us. And if if anyone uh, does want to contact us, um, that we do have a special form on our website that is for facilities. It goes to a private mailbox that only um, we get access to, to Tam and myself. Um, so if you did want to get in touch, that's the best way to, to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Tam. And thank you for sharing your journey with us, um, uh, some of the insights into the wonderful personal stories with those animals and also some of the logistics around what you do. Um, and uh, we are getting questions coming through and I'll bring those to the panel as a whole when, when we have our final speaker. So with no further ado, I'd like to now introduce Carly Motley. Carly is the Animal Facility Technical Coordinator at the University of Wollongong. She's a laboratory animal technician with a degree in animal science and has experience in animal welfare research both in Australia and overseas and is the animal rehoming coordinator at her current research institution. Thank you very much for joining us today Carly and um, over to you. Thank you. I'll just get my presentation on the screen. So I'd just like to talk to everybody today about rehoming from the animal facility perspective. So as briefly mentioned, um, I currently work in an animal facility. I have a Bachelor of Animal Science and I've worked in multiple facilities, both as an animal technician, uh, a facility coordinator and an animal facility advisor. So I've been involved in rehoming lab animals since 2017 and the majority of these animals have been rehomed through a third party rehoming service with a small amount being rehomed privately to people involved with the facility. Um, so during this time, I've been working in a rehoming coordinator role and we've rehomed over 100 animals from our facility since 2017. And this is including mostly rats and mice, but also a small number of fish as well. So the animal facility plays a pretty important part in rehoming. Um, one of those is promoting the 
option for rehoming animals to research groups. So that might be giving presentations to your research groups or including rehoming as an endpoint in any of your animal ethics forms. The animal facility is also involved in identifying those animals that are suitable for rehoming and at times supporting the third party rehoming service. So I'll go into a little bit more about that later. So rehoming through an animal facility requires a bit of coordinated effort and buy-in. Um, it's not necessary, but it's helpful to have somebody in your facility acting in a rehoming coordinator role. So this could be an animal technician or animal care staff, um, and this role can provide a good professional development opportunity for them as well. So the rehoming coordinator role might involve identifying and assessing animals, whether they're suitable for rehoming or not, um, liaising with the third party rehoming service about animal pickup or transport, and coordinating any paperwork and documents that need to accompany the animals into their new homes. It also helps to have a facility veterinarian. This person can be internal or external, it doesn't really matter, um, but their role would be to perform a health check on the animals prior to rehoming, just to ensure that they're leaving the facility in the best health possible. So when you're considering implementing a rehoming program, it's important to have a lot of engagement with your animal ethics committee and any of the senior executive staff at your institution. So these are the people that are going to decide whether it's okay for you to rehome or not. So it's always helpful to make a strong case. Um, sometimes that might include inviting a representative from a third party rehoming service to give a presentation to the AEC or to the executive staff. And in that presentation, they might want to outline the benefits to the animals. So obviously, um, giving them a second chance at life is a massive benefit and also the benefits to the institution. So we've been finding that rehoming is a great opportunity to build relationships external to our institution. So that's relationships with our third party rehoming service and just with the general community um, to promote the good work that we do. So if you are considering rehoming through a third party rehoming service, it helps to reach out to them and give them some information about the number and species of animals that you might be interested in rehoming, whether you're able to provide any assistance with the transition to rehoming program or even assistance with transporting animals, um, or even if you're able to provide assistance with fostering animals. So um, we've often done a few of these things. We've done a little bit of animal transport to drop them off at the rehoming service. And we've also fostered animals in the home environment before they're able to be um, sent to their new adoptive homes. So when considering a rehoming program, it's also important to have a think about the legal considerations and implications of the program. So generally the third party rehoming service can help with drafting a formal rehoming agreement. And then obviously um, collaborating with the legal department at, in, at your institution to come up with a formal agreement is really helpful too. So within any kind of rehoming contract or rehoming agreement or transfer, transfer of ownership agreement, um, you want to outline the transfer of care. So where the responsibilities end for the animal facility and where they begin with the third party rehoming service. It's also important to include confidentiality for both parties. So in our case, we don't know where the animals are going and likewise, the new owners don't know what institution the animals have come from. Um, and so that's just confidentiality for safety reasons. But um, as mentioned in the previous talks, doing it through a third party rehoming service, we still do get updates on the animals um, and we do know how they're going and whether they've encountered any issues along the way. And we have the opportunity to provide advice and help where we can. Um, it's also important to consider a termination of agreement clause in your rehoming contract, just in case for whatever reason, the rehoming um, arrangement isn't working for either party. So the animal facility is responsible for firstly assessing those animals that are suitable for rehoming. Um, particularly with rats and mice, consideration of genotype is important. So currently under OGT regulation, 
sorry, OGTR regulations, we can't rehome any animals that are genetically modified or that contain genetically modified organisms. So in our instance for our rats and mice, we rehome wild type animals only. We also temperament test the animals to identify those suitable for rehoming. So we want to pick the animals that have a more gentle, amenable temperament that are easily able to integrate to the home environment. Um, it would be pretty irresponsible of us to rehome anything that's outwardly aggressive if we're not able to put in additional training and handling to try and um, alleviate that aggression prior to rehoming. Um, as mentioned before, we also want them to have a veterinary health check before they go, just to make sure we're not sending any animals with any um, long-term problems that are difficult to manage. Um, and we also make sure that we just have animals that are going that have had the minimal number of procedures or minimally invasive procedures. So we don't select animals for rehoming that have had major surgeries or have been exposed to novel drug treatments, um, partly because these animals are required for experimental purposes, um, but also it would um, probably be a bit irresponsible to send something that may have long-term implications for the animal's health. So this is an example of a rat temperament testing matrix that we've developed to help assess our rats temperaments for rehoming. So on the left is a list of um, either common rat behaviours or just observations that we can make about that animal's behaviour and temperament. So is the animal brave? Does it engage with its handlers? Does it allow you to pat it? Um, or is it aggressive and does it vocalise and does it bite? So the idea is that the animals are observed for a period of about 10 minutes. Realistically, we're working with these animals every day. So we are, um, you know, assessing them daily, really. Um, but observe the animal for about 10 minutes and place a tick in the appropriate column. So the idea is that animals with more ticks in the green column indicate more positive behaviours. And these animals might be more likely to um, integrate better into the home environment and become better pets than those animals with ticks in the red column that indicate slightly negative behaviours. This is a similar matrix for mice. It doesn't have as many observations in it just because their behaviour isn't quite as complex as rats, but the similar principle applies. Um, so the animals are observed and an assessment is made. And both of these matrices are available in the ARP rehoming guidelines. So once you've identified animals that are suitable for rehoming and they've had their health assessment, it helps to prepare them for rehoming by just introducing some kind of um, transition to rehoming program. So for our animals, we expose them to novel things that they might find in the household environment. So that could be introducing new food that they might commonly be fed as treats. We might change their caging. So this is particularly important for rodents who might be housed in individually ventilated cages. We'll move them into a wire cage just so they can be exposed to more sights and sounds and smells that might be hampered by that IVC environment. We also increase their handling and we also get different people to handle them. So that's so they become used to different humans and the sounds and smells that we all make. Um, and also so they get used to different handling methods. Um, you know, they might be going to homes where they're handled by children, for example. In the transition to rehoming program, it's a good opportunity con to conduct any preventative health care. So that might be parasite treatment or in the case of livestock, it might be shearing the sheep or something like that, just so that they're ready to go and they don't need too much upkeep once they're in their home environment. Um, and if it's possible or applicable, you might also consider desexing the animals prior to going to their new home. So we've already touched on a lot of the benefits um, of rehoming, but in my opinion, I feel that rehoming contributes directly to the three R's of replacement, reduction and refinement. So we're obviously replacing euthanasia as an endpoint at the conclusion of experiments. And this goes hand in hand with reducing animal wastage. So at the institution that I'm at, at the moment, um, since we've been rehoming since 2017, we've had zero animal wastage. So animals are either um, used for experimental reasons, they're assessed for rehoming, they go to 
be rehomed or if they're not suitable because perhaps they're genetically modified animals, we'll retain those animals for researcher training instead. Um, rehoming find your fate endpoints, so euthanasia um, can be replaced by rehoming as mentioned. And I've found that it just rejuvenates relationships and engagement again with the third party rehoming organisations and just other external collaborators or members of the public. So it contributes greatly to staff and researcher morale. And sometimes it's one of the, the only things that keeps you going is knowing that at the end of the experiment that these animals can go to their new home. So some future considerations to increase rehoming engagement, um, and these are just based on general observations and opinions and just from talking to a multitude of people who are really interested in rehoming but are just not quite ready to take that leap yet. Um, I feel that rehoming does have more opportunity to create openness um, with the community. So whether that's having um, the animal facility maybe contribute to a newsletter or something like that, or a little behind the scenes of the animal facility section. Um, the options are endless, really. We've got this doorway to the community through these third party rehoming services, and why don't we use them more? Um, Collaborative language is an important one too. So sometimes um, you might read some comments or something on social media and people are talking about rescuing these animals from these terrible conditions. I know having worked in multiple facilities that um, we're all specially trained people that care greatly for the animals in our care. So perhaps consider suggesting that these animals are surrendered from research institutions rather than rescued might be a way to get a few more animal facilities interested in rehoming. Um, and we're also here and available for any kind of education. So I know a lot of animal technicians that I've worked with are experts in animal care and nutrition and animal behaviour. And there's ways that we could try and um, convey that information to new pet owners to be able to help the transition for their animals go a bit more smoothly. So realistically, we all have the same goal and rehoming wouldn't be possible if the people in the animal facilities weren't as passionate about it as the people in the rehoming organisations. So thank you for considering rehoming and we're looking forward to answering some questions. Thank you so much, Carly. And I think that was a really nice sort of final presentation to give us a really broad perspective, um, both from the rehoming third party providers, as you've implied, and also the institution themselves. So before we go to questions, I just want to everyone to please virtually give a hand clap for our speakers. Um, absolutely fantastic presentations today. Really, really wonderful. Okay, look, um, what I'm going to do, I know we don't have a lot of time yet. So we do have a lot of questions that are, have come through. And um, can I get our speakers to turn their cameras on? Thank you. And the first question is for Paula, um, and it's around logistics indeed, and whether or not there are, noting that you're based in New South Wales, is it possible for um, organisations such as yours to assist in rehoming rats and mice from interstate establishments? Um, yeah, the, the, the general answer to that would be yes. We do, in fact, sometimes we send some of our, some of our rats particularly um, interstate as well for rehoming. So um, yes, we are open to discussing that. And um, it really, a lot of these arrangements really do depend on the individual circumstances. And we can certainly provide services where there is a demand for that. So we're always very happy to talk about it. And we, we do encourage you to get in touch with us as early as possible in that process so that we've all got, you know, sort of several weeks at least or months to organise how we're going to do that, the logistics of how it will work. Um, so, yeah, very happy to talk about any interstate rehoming. Thank you, Paula. Um, I have a question for Nikki and Tam um, around uh, your, your organisation's policy around desexing, um, either prior to receiving animals or prior to you actually rehoming them, having um, you know, established their position within your organisation to start with. Nikki, do you want to take it? Um, yeah, all our animals get desexed before rehoming. Um, a lot of the time, it's or they've already been desexed at the facility. Um, but if not, yeah, we make sure that's done before even putting them into foster care. They all get desexed. Okay. Thank I, I think you. over the years of working with facilities, there's probably only been 
six dogs and one cat that have come through that haven't been desexed prior to coming into our care. Um, so, yeah, that's something the facilities have all been absolutely amazing at um, taking on. Okay, great. And, and I noted Carly talked about this X thing as well in her presentation. So, and um, Paula, did you want to comment as well on, on sort of your policy around desexing with the animals that you're assisting to rehome? Yeah, definitely. So we've got the same policy around with dogs and cats. They are desexed um, as soon as possible, as soon as they come into care. But often with dogs and cats, um, they, they're often a bit older and they, they generally are already desexed when we receive them. Um, in terms of other species, um, we desex all our rabbits. Um, they usually get that done while they're in foster care. Um, we sometimes dissect some of the guinea pigs, but not always. So really it's dependent on their situation and their temperament. So if we're having difficulty bonding them or fitting them into an existing group, we might get some of the males dissexed, but obviously there is a risk with um, uh, anaesthetic with guinea pigs um, as there are with, with rabbits too. Um, so we try and keep that to as minimum as possible. Often our guinea pigs are quite young, so we can bond them fairly successfully without having to do sex. Most of them are male. Um, in terms of rats we, and mice, no, we don't routinely dissex them or um, provide any sort of implants or anything like that. Sometimes facilities will dissex the rats prior to them coming out. And we do recommend that wherever possible because we find we get greater longevity and less health issues, age-related health issues like mammary tumours as they age. So we do prefer them to be dissexed, but we understand that's not always going to be possible and depending on the numbers as well. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Paula. Carla, I have a question for you, which is actually really quite an interesting one around you talked about preparing your animals for rehoming. And someone's asked about, um, do your rodents have exposure to diverse microbiomes before rehoming? Yeah, so our rodents are housed in individually ventilated cages, as most of them are in facilities in Australia. So um, they're in their own little microclimate there. So in our transition to rehoming program where we can, we'll put those animals into a wire top cage and move them into different areas of the facility. Um, and in other cases, we've also moved them to different buildings. So sometimes a few of our um, different groups that we work with in the universities and institutions will want to have a little play date with the animals so they'll they'll go in their cage over there so that's exposing them to um, yeah, different bacteria or pathogens or something like that to sort of make them a bit more robust and healthy before going into the home environment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I have a question that's probably more for, for Paula and for Tam and Nikki. Um, and maybe Tam and Nikki, I could get you to respond first is, and it's, you know, it's a really interesting question too. How do you approach questions from potential owners who ask what research were the animals involved in? Um, our sort of blanket response is that we don't get um, access to that information and that um, anything that they've been through has no effect on their current health and, and no, you know, long-term effects on, on the animal. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Paula. Yeah, we, we, we do the same. I mean, it's quite simple, really, if, if people ask that, and they sometimes do, but not always. Um, we, we simply say that we don't have access to that information, but what we can tell them is we have access to anything that's critical to their ongoing care and that we do always disclose that at the point of adoption or prior to um, in our discussions with them. And, um, we're, and, you know, just reassure them that we have all the information we need to, don't, to know about the animal's care. Um, and we just, we don't really, we just don't enter into discussion around that. It's the same as our, the way we treat our marketing and communications. We, we do have protocols and procedures around that. We're very sensitive about how we, um, how we present the charity and the work that we do. There are certain words that we don't use. Um, there are certain phrases we don't use because we find that they're emotive and probably not helpful in terms of the relationships we have with our research partners. So um, we're sensitive in the way that we approach our communications. We focus on the animal's life that we're providing now after research and we simply make the statement that that the animal has come from research into this life and we focus on the life that we're providing for them in the community we don't focus on where they've come from okay. and that's another benefit of the foster care that you can turn um, questions simply like that into the focus on well what we can tell you about the animal is that they love going for walks. They've just discovered that roast chicken exists and they think it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. We, we turn it around so it becomes a positive 
and walk the families through where we go from here rather than where they've come from. And there's really, I think the people that are taking on facility animals are a very different kind of people. Um, they're very passionate. They're wanting to help these animals adjust to a new world. For, for us, because we deal with so many beagles, um, most of our families have come from a background where they've had at least four beagles, if not more. So for them, it's an absolute joy at perhaps entering into a relationship with a 10-year-old puppy because that's what some of these guys are when they come out. They start having their adult puppyhoods and it completely changes the, the entire relationship and the focus. Thank you. Um, that, that's a nice little segue, actually, when you say puppy and adulthood. There have been a couple of questions around age. So maybe to all the panel, um, is there a minimum? Is there a maximum? I know, Tam and Nikki, you said there wasn't an age limit for you, but what about sort of the earlier age as well? Um, so maybe I'll Carly ask you first in terms of the ages of animals that you've been working with to rehome. Yeah, so um, just with our rats and mice, I currently just work in a experimental facility. So the animals that we have aren't very old. Um, I think we've rehomed some that have been over 12 months old is probably the oldest at this stage. Um, but that's okay. mostly based on availability, not necessarily age related problems. So we just don't have them much older than that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Paula, you mentioned that some of your mice live to a, a grand old age of two and a half years. So mm. for you, what are your age considerations? Well, really, age is no limit for us. Um, I think for us, it's more about is the animal physically capable of transferring from the facility to another environment? That's really our consideration. It's always around quality of life. It's a quality of life issue, and that takes in a number of different factors, but not always considering age. As Tam pointed out, some of our dogs recently have been eight or nine years of age, and they definitely go through a puppyhood stage when they come out, so they have a great burst of energy and enthusiasm when they're first out. And obviously it's a highly stimulating environment for them to come into compared to what they may have been accustomed to. So we just monitor them while they're in their early stages. We usually provide them with um, a higher grade of food or something that's a bit higher in fat because they're burning off a lot of energy, you know, in those first couple of weeks of the transition. So for us, age is not necessarily a defining factor. It's just one factor to be considered amongst many others. Okay, and and Tamaniki, you said that you know you've had older animals. Is there a, a, an earlier age as well, or that you really again have that similar philosophy? Yeah, same philosophy. Yeah. Uh, I think the youngest we've had um, come into our care was probably about four months of age, um, because they just weren't coping in the environment, and um, the panel decided that the best thing to do would be to retire them and. He now lives the most amazing life on a winery in Northern Victoria and I wish the family had adopted me. So I was about to say half his luck, exactly. Yeah, yeah. very much okay. so. Okay, thank you. Look, I think we've got time for one more question, which is um, just around, I know you've touched on it briefly. Um, so it's probably more for Nikki and Tam and Paula around the, there's a responsibility, I suppose, within AECs to ensure the ongoing well-being of the animals and, and what type of reporting goes back to those AECs. I know you've touched on it briefly. If I could just get you to sort of quickly reiterate that for us. So maybe Tam and Nikki first. So reporting uh, yes, back to the institution, yeah. We... We keep in touch with um, all our facilities, with the, or sometimes with the con, you know, the main contact person, but also sometimes with the actual staff and the and the individual handlers as well. Um, we have a, a private um, photo sharing platform where we upload photos and videos of them in their new homes, um, and that's only available if you have the the link, and we send that to we regularly send updates to the facilities that we work with and they they often share it around and um, we quite often hear that they print them out and, and stick them up on the walls and stuff around the office and um, yeah that if, if they want to know something or an update on a particular animal they just need to let us know and, and we'll keep them updated okay so you maintain quite a strong relationship yeah. with the institutions yep yeah, it's um, and and it's it's a it's a beautiful relationship. It's one that I think both parties have developed over time. And I mean, it's it's trust based. It's something that um, I really enjoy. 
it's um, it's usually myself um, and one of our other committee members that go out on site. And I will openly say I've made some really good friends in the industry and I adore seeing them, catching up with them. Um, many times we'll turn up uh, at Christmas last year, we turned up to receive a, a heap of gifts from one of our favourite um, managers on site. But the fact that we can collaborate in, in such a way is so unique and such a special moment that we can all have because it, it has made such a big difference for little things that we'll do, um, if there's any vet feedback from our vets or any reports that can go back to the AC, um, a lot of the vets from in the industry say that they'd like to continue learning. They'd like to know how the animals adjusted, not just on a behavioural front, but on a medical side as well. So we'll um, send back any of the reports that are required from MRIs to X-rays, um, ongoing blood panels. Vets will contact us directly and they also have our vets details because we do, do have the consistency of the side we've had for 18 years which again helps with confidentiality on all sides as well mm -hmm. okay yep paula maybe briefly noting we're, we're now running over time so thank you just your relationship with those institutions reporting back for the aecs yeah this is this is a common question that, that arises and i think some of this some of this can be addressed in the rehoming agreement that we've both mentioned <clears throat> both groups you know, we have this rehoming agreement with research establishments and that that outlines the responsibilities, you know, both parties. That is the responsibility that we take as the third party rehomer um, in terms of how we're going to conduct our rehoming and some of the standards that we have. So that provides some reassurance. But essentially, as Tam said, it is a trust based relationship and it's one that develops over time. And it's surprising. And I think most would find it surprising how close the relationships become between us and the research partners, because we need to talk about animals in a lot of detail. We become friends in the process usually. And I, it's, we're usually just in constant contact. Like they're not really ever wondering what's happening because I'm usually sending them videos or texts or um, updates on what's going on. So um, I think once you get into, the, it's one thing to consider it in theory, but once you get into practice, you start to see how it actually works. And this becomes a non-issue after a while. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Well, look, on that, that I think very positive note, I'd like to um, thank all our speakers once again for participating and also being willing to take questions at the end of this session. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I think we hit up to 124 attendees at one point, which is, I think, just outstanding. Thank you very much. And obviously from around different parts of Australia. Um, in the coming weeks, we will have a recording of the webinar available for people to view, and we will put together a bit of a Q&A for questions that we didn't get time to get to today. And just a bit of a plug for the ARP, um, we have upcoming seminars later on during the year, one on uh, statistics for animal ethics committees, another on around ethical decision making for eth animal ethics committees. So look, thank you everyone again for joining us today. Um, again, thank you to our speakers and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in the series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Tam. Really appreciate it.